hope you still have your copy of God's Word open to Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 41. We're going to be a doing an in-depth study of every single word in this passage today. <laughs> not true, not true. This past week, uh, Monday through um, yesterday actually, I prayed that God would give me an opportunity to talk to somebody about Jesus. I told him I wanted to be available to him, be you know, used as he desires. Um, unfortunately, I did not have an opportunity this week to talk to anybody about Jesus. Tried to a couple of times, um, but it was unsuccessful. Um, all I ask from you, what I'm asking of myself, is to be available to God. Uh, I do ask that you learn the gospel. Okay, You need to know that much. But other than that, God will take care of the rest when, in his good time. One last commercial before we get into the message. Here in a couple of weeks is the dinner on the grounds, May 19th. Um, and we're in challenging our congregation to invite somebody to church that day. We'll have some more information during the announcements about that Sunday, but pray about who God would lead you to invite to church. Um, that's what we're trying to do. All right. There's a gentleman that I follow on X, which will forever be Twitter. All right. His name is Dr. Ed Stetzer, and let me tell you something, folks. He is a brilliant Christian, very, very, very smart gentleman. All right. He does not pastor. He is in the academic world of uh, of Christianity, but uh, he is often asked to do interims and he preaches uh, supply for people. And when he is going to be in somebody's pulpit on, on a Sunday, he always puts the same t um, tweet across. And he says this, pray that I make much of Jesus. You know, I, I like that. Make much of Jesus. You know, we ought to be that ought to be our goal as Christians, to make much of Jesus. We ought to be, you know, in our private life, we ought to strive to make much of Jesus. In our public life, we ought to strive to make much of Jesus. In our professional life, in our social life, we ought to strive to make much of Jesus. In our recreational life, we need to strive to make much of Jesus. And it may sound a little strange, but yes, even in our church life, we need to make much of Jesus. There should be no part of our life where we exclude Jesus. If Jesus is our Savior, then he also is our Lord. And that is not a part-time job we're asking him to do. It's a full-time job. We're asking him to be the Lord of our life 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, as strange as it may seem, we need to make much of Jesus when we're talking about Christianity and salvation to a lost person. For it is possible to talk about church life, to talk about the Bible, to talk about um, salvation and not talk about Jesus very much. Now when we do that, it's not biblical evangelism. Because biblical evangelism is built on and is surrounded by the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we share the gospel with somebody, zero in on Jesus Christ. That's who we need to deal with when it comes to our salvation or somebody else's salvation. The central theme of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost is found in verse 36. Look with me in your Bibles at that verse. Peter says this, Therefore let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Friends, we can only do what Peter did. We need to make much of Jesus. 
when you talk to somebody about Christ, bring them to the Messiah. Bring them to the cross and to the empty tomb. Talk to them about Jesus. Peter's sermon today has four sections that we're going to take a, a brief look at. Each section helps us understand what we need to be doing when we share our faith, when we're doing the work of evangelism. All right? The first section is an explanation of the charges that were brought by the crowd against the 120 men and women that were in the upper room. You will recall from last Sunday, if you were with us, that when the Holy Spirit came upon the church in that prayer meeting on Palm, uh, on uh, excuse me, uh, Pentecost Sunday, those people came out of the house and went out into the street, and some of the people in the crowd said of them, "They're drunk." Well, they weren't. That Peter says, as part of beginning his explanation, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning, folks. Now, yeah, there are some drunks on Skid Row, maybe, that you know are drunk all the time. But in order to get drunk on the wine that these guys were accused of drinking, what's called new wine or sweet wine, they would have had to have started the day before and just drunk all day and all night because there was about a 0.05% alcohol rate in this kind of wine. you got to drink it all day. And the day's only three hours old. So Peter says, first of all, they're not drunk. So what's going on? Well, Peter and the other apostles, because remember, they're all standing kind of together, but it's Peter who, who gets up on the, the, the rock, I guess, or the tree stump in order to preach. And Peter tells the crowd that what you are witnessing is pro prophesied by the prophet Joel. And it's a fulfillment of the coming of the Holy Spirit upon God's people. Now, Joel prophesied 800 years before Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to reread the whole passage I'm going to pick and choose some passages to read to, that makes my, the points I'm trying to make. But I want you to see here in verses 17 and 18 what Joel says. Now, again, don't go to you know, the, the book of Joel. Stay in Acts 2. 17 and 18. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. And then your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. So, Peter is saying here that Joel predicted what the crowd's witnessing. Now, every good Jew and the city's full of it at the full of them at you know at Pentecost the feast of weeks as the Jews would call it they knew the word of god and they understood that in Ezekiel god's presence in the temple left to the edge of the city and then it left to the mount of olives and then it was gone and here it says that God says, I will pour out my spirit on, on who? On, the, on all people. Now, the Jews had a, had a question mark. This is kind of one of those verses that's a head scratcher. For the Jews understood that the Jewish people were the people of God. They were God's special chosen people. But this doesn't say that they will be, the spirit will be poured out on the Jews on all people. So what's going on here? Well, the Holy Spirit is given to everyone who will accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, whether you be a Jew or a Gentile. Now I want you to note that Joel's prophecy here that Peter quotes is talking about miracles. All right? Um, the rushing wind inside the house with a calm outside, that's a miracle. 
the tongues of flame that came and settled on everybody present in the upper room, that 120 uh, men and women. It's a miracle. When they all came out into the street speaking languages that they did not know, that's a miracle. And Joel is predicting that this is kind of thing is going to be happening. Now he calls it, you know, we'll prophesy and see visions and dream dreams. But the point is, miracles are going to be accompanying the giving of the Holy Spirit. And Joel also mentions the blood, fire, smoke, darkness, the blood moon, and, and some other things that are uh, signs of the return of Christ. And perhaps Jesus is coming back in our lifetime. I sure hope so. I hope you do too. But notice what um, Peter says as he begins in verse 17. And it will be in when? In the last days, says God. You want to know when the last days begin? They began back during at Pentecost, or you could take it back even to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. All right, this is when God is going to begin working in the world to bring all people to salvation. Now, not everybody's going to get saved, all right? But God's working to bring all people into salvation. But there will be people who will reject Jesus and choose their own sinfulness. So um, these things are these things are happening here that they're they're witnessing. Now there's there's another lady I follow on on Twitter and folks it'll be always Twitter to me. Uh, I honestly I don't remember her name. I, I came across one of her tweets one time and I said oh, you know I like this so I follow her, and she posts every day Christian. We are one day closer to heaven. And I like that. I am so thankful that God has promised us heaven. All right, we're one day closer today than we were yesterday. But what that also means to us, ladies and gentlemen, is that our neighbors, our co-workers, our family members, our classmates, they are also one day closer to judgment. We cannot... Take the risk of thinking, well, we have plenty of time to share the gospel with them. We really don't. For all we know, before we even leave this worship center, we're going to hear the trumpet of God blast. And Christ is coming back. Or it's very possible, and I pray this does not happen, but it is possible when you pull out of this parking lot onto Liberty Road, you may not make it into the second lane. This is why today is the day of salvation. Make sure you're right with God today before you leave this room because you may not get tomorrow. I want you to notice, and you might need to think back about when, when Pastor Chad read this passage, but Peter is making much of Jesus. All right? And he is later going to say, in Acts 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It is the name Jesus of Nazareth, that individual, that person, that we must deal with. Now, when we get to verse 22, Peter really gets into the heart of his sermon, his message. And here he does something that's kind of kind of interesting <laughs> from a preaching perspective. He brings an accusation against the crowd. He does. And he makes two points. I want to show you these two points, and then he does an illustration. I'll show you what that is in a moment. But he deals, first of all, with Jesus' crucifixion and then with his resurrection. And he begins by placing the blame for the crucifixion on the people that he's talking to. Look with me at verse 23. He says, you're responsible for Jesus' salvation. Verse 23, though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. And that lawless people refers to the Romans, the Gentiles. But 
Peter is saying here to the people that are listening to him, you guys are responsible. It's your fault that Jesus was crucified. And that is certainly true. Now there is in one sense, Peter is not talking specifically to those people. Now it is possible that maybe somebody that was there listening to Peter was among the crowd on um, Good Friday shouting, crucify him. But it's also very probable none of them were there on Good Friday. So what Peter's saying here with this word you, rather than it being an individual you, Peter's talking about everybody, which even includes you and me today. All right? For Jesus Christ died on the cross for whose sin? For everyone's sin. For the Jews and for the Gentiles. For the people of Peter's day as well as for the people of our day. And if he tarries 10,000 years for the people of that day as well. We are all responsible for Jesus being nailed to the cross. Because he was willing to die for you and for me. Jesus understood it was my personal sin that keeps me from knowing God and prevents me from having that relationship with God. And Jesus was willing to go to the cross for me and for you. But that's not the end of the story. God also raised Jesus back to life. Look at verse 24 with me. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. Now the blame for Jesus' crucifixion was on the people, and rightly so. But who raised Jesus back to life? God did. All right? That's what makes salvation possible. Had Jesus just been some criminal that died on the cross, there'd be no salvation. Had Jesus been crucified and laid in the tomb and some medical doctor came in and said, well, I think he's got a coma. Let me give him an injection. And, and he somehow comes back to life. There would be no salvation. But it's God who raised Jesus from the dead. And therefore, God provides salvation for us. We cannot save ourselves. There is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. Now Peter then shifts his sermon to an illustration that supports his argument. And the illustration is from King David, from the Psalms. All right? Now, David um, is not normally considered a prophet, but some of the Psalms that he is attributed to have written have a prophetic end to it, so yeah, he can be counted among the prophets, all right? Um, his tomb to this very day is in Jerusalem. I've actually been there, okay? It's a, kind of a neat place to, to visit if you ever get a chance. But look what Peter says in verse 29. He says, brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Now, why do we die physically? Please don't give me a medical reason that the heart stops beating and the brain stops waving, you know. And, you know. No, that's not the point. The point is, we die physically because of sin. All right? We die physically because of sin. And until Christ returns... Every single one of us can expect that to happen. I would like to issue a memo to the church. I've never done it. Prohibiting you from dying because I just assume not do any funerals. I don't like doing funerals. But unfortunately, that's the course of life. And David, who is considered one of the greatest Israelites to ever have lived, is still dead in his sin. Why? of sin and the Jews understood that and Peter is saying that Jesus died to provide forgiveness 
even to men like Israel. But David also predicted the resurrection of the Messiah. I want you to look at verses 30, 31. Peter says this, Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. And seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned to Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. Okay, David's the greatest king that Israel's ever had, but God promised David that God would raise up one of his descendants, not two of his descendants, not a whole bunch of his descendants. God would raise up one of his descendants who would rule on his throne, David's throne, forever. Well, how is that possible? Well, it's only possible when God raises up someone from the dead. And that's what God did with Jesus. Jesus died on the cross on Good Friday, was resurrected on Sunday morning, and never died again. He ascended fully up into heaven alive, and he took his seat at the right hand of the Father fully alive. And because he is alive, he now rules and reigns forever and ever. In fact, Peter goes on to say that he was not abandoned to Hades. Now, literally, that would be the word Sheol in the, in the Hebrew. Sheol is the place of the dead in uh, Jewish thought in biblical times, okay? Um, that's where everybody, good and bad, went. So that's where they would have expected Jesus to go, though he went to heaven. But anyway, we'll give him a little credit there for a moment. All right? He wasn't left there. In other words, his body's still not in some tomb over in Jerusalem somewhere. All right? In other words, his body did not see decay because he came back fully to life. Not just life in a new body, but life in the original body. Uh, complete with the, the wound marks. Um, he was the same person after the resurrection that he was just before. And then Peter gets to his primary point. It's what we've already looked at today. He says in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know with certainty. You don't need to worry about this. You don't need to wonder. You can be certain. That, th that God has made this Jesus of Nazareth whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. And the word Lord there goes to the idea of Jesus' divinity. He is God. But the Messiah goes to the idea of his uh, deliverance of salvation. He is God and he provides salvation for us through his death and resurrection. Ladies and gentlemen, when we're doing evangelism, we must take people to the death and, and resurrection of Christ. That is the core of the gospel message. That is the only thing we really have to preach. If we leave out the resurrection of Christ, there is no hope. So when you're talking to somebody about Jesus, take them to the cross, take them to the tomb, because they must deal with who Christ is. Like Peter, we need to let our lost friends know that it's our sins that caused Jesus to die on the cross. And he did it for me and for you so that you and I can have salvation. Isn't that awesome? That's why it's, you know, it's grace. That's God's work in our life. And Peter declared his main point. The crowd, it te tells us in verse 37, was pierced to the heart. Now this is something that only God can do. You and I cannot convict anybody of their sins. We might point them out, <laughs> and you want to be careful about doing that a little bit. But it's, the, it's God who brings conviction. Look with me at the, at the fullness of verse 37. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? If we need salvation, and if it's truly from Jesus Christ, what are we to do? What, what's next? Friends, we cannot, as I've just said, 
convict anybody of their sin. But you and I can kind of set the table, as we sometimes might say. And what I mean by that is, when you do the work of evangelism with love and grace, the person that you're talking to is going to recognize that. Friends, we don't need to be like some of those street preachers that you know wave the big King James Bible and say, you're going to hell if you don't turn. Turn and burn. There's no love in that. When you're talking to family or friends, even co-workers or classmates, let the love of Christ fill your heart when you share the overflow with the person you're talking to. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and what's the second part? Love our neighbor as ourselves. Let that saturate our evangelism. When it does, the Holy Spirit will bring that person that you're talking to to a conviction. We now come to the most important part of, of Peter's sermon. And he's made a strong case to this point about the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. The crowd is under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. What is left to be done is to challenge the unbelievers, the non-Christians, to give their lives to Christ. Here's the challenge. In verse 38, Peter answers their question of what should we do. And he says, repent. 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 Now, some of you may be looking at your Bibles. Well, wait a minute, preacher. It says repent and be baptized. Well, yeah, it sort of says that and it sort of doesn't. All right, let me explain. As we read this in the English, it looks like repent and be baptized are all on the same grammatical level. But in reality, they're not. The word repent in this sentence is in the dative case, which makes it the direct object of the, of the sentence. And it means that everything else in the sentence builds its weight or its power from the word repent. Peter says, repent, and as a sign of your repentance, be baptized. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what does Ephesians 2, 8, 9 say? For by grace are we saved through what? And this is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not by what? Works. works. Not by works. Sierra and Brianna, I'm not going to pick on you, but thank you for letting me baptize you today. That's just like saying sick them to a dog. I get excited when I get to do baptisms. But that was a work. They willingly walked down those steps into the baptistry and allowed me to lower them into the water and to bring them back up. And I encourage you, if you haven't been baptized, to follow in their footsteps. But ladies and gentlemen, that is a work that has nothing to do with your salvation. The, the thief on the cross died without being baptized. It is possible that you might go through your Christian life and never be baptized. However, you're not being a good Christian if that's the case because um, Jesus says, go into all the world and um, preach the gospel, baptizing them. So baptism is actually the first of the commandments that we're supposed to be uh, obey. So Peter here is saying in verse 38, repent, and as a sign of repentance, get baptized. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been your pastor for over 25 years, and I've never seen Jesus in a single one of you. And you've never seen Jesus in me. Now, obviously, if I watch your life long enough, I can see how you react with your husband or your wife or with your job or whatever it is, and I can begin to sense the presence of Christ in your life and maybe the absence of, it, of him. I can't see Jesus in you. Yet every one of us that was in here watched Brianna and Sierra give testimony of the change in their life as they followed Christ now. You see, that's an outward sign. All right? What happens when we repent? Two things. And I'm speaking of the initial 
repentance unto salvation. All right, number one, we receive forgiveness of our sins. When we repent of our sins and begin living the way God command, commands us, God forgives us of our sins. Friends, it doesn't matter if you come and sign a membership card. It doesn't matter if you go through the waters of baptism. If you have no intention of living like God wants you to, why will he forgive you? He won't. There's, you know, he's looking at your heart. He's able to see the future like we see the present, probably even more clearly. And he knows to the person who's willing to, to serve Christ. And that individual receives forgiveness of sins. Now that's number one. Second thing is, we also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we repent of our sins, begin living the way that God wants us to live, in that initial moment, God understands what's going to take place in the future. He's not asking us to be perfect. He's asking us to be committed. And in that moment, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God himself comes and takes up residence in our life. Please understand, because it's not by works, the Holy Spirit is a gift, just like salvation is a gift. You can reject it, you can say, I don't want it, or you can say, thank you, Lord, for saving a sinner like me. Who can receive the Holy Spirit? Well, Peter says, um, where is it? Uh, verse 40, uh, with many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, be saved from this corrupt and sabbatical generation. Friends, salvation is for anyone. Anyone who's willing to turn from their sins and begin living the way God wants us to live. You, you, you can't do it perfectly. God does not expect you to be doing it perfectly. But He's asking us to be committed, to learn to grow. Remember when your child couldn't even roll over when you first brought them home from the hospital? And then when they were about a week old, they managed to roll over a little bit. And after a couple of months, they can start crawling and then they stand up for the first time and you're so excited and then parenting becomes extremely hard after that because you're chasing that kid everywhere. All right? Just as a child grows physically and learns to do more things, so should you and I be growing spiritually and learning to do more and more things in Christ. I have had in my time as a minister seen a lot of evangelism programs. And sadly, a lot of them leave out repentance. But I want to close by showing you what Peter does not say. Peter does not say, say this prayer and you'll be saved. Peter does not say that church membership will save you. Though I would add, church membership is important. You need to be part of a church family. And I encourage you to be part of us. Peter does not say, follow your heart. Peter does not say, do what feels right to you. Peter does not say, all religions lead to heaven. He says, there is one name given among men by which we must be saved. And it's the name Jesus. Friends, our, our, our family, our friends, our co-workers, our classmates, everybody needs to hear about Jesus. If they go to the mass media, they'll hear about Jesus, but they won't hear the real Jesus. You and I need to tell them about the real Jesus. Call them to, to the death and resurrection of Christ. Call them to repentance. Without repentance, there is no salvation.